Thank you. Well, this is special. Peter B. Collins has brought in Rusty Schweigert, who is uh, Apollo astronaut Apollo 9, uh, tested the, the LEM for the astronauts to land on the moon. And early on, he warned us about uh, extraterrestrial objects uh, hurtling into space and uh, destroying the planet instead of us. And that's not fair. So Peter B. Collins joins us. Why don't you introduce our, our special guest? I'm going to listen. And then depending on how much time uh, R Rusty has, uh, we'll, maybe I can ask a question. Hopefully, particle physicist Professor Marianne Cummings can join us. Uh, and she and uh, Rusty can speak a language that neither you or I can <laughs> understand. Thank you. Good we'll have David. time for a, for a question from you too, David. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and David, I want you to know that uh, when Rusty got my invitation to appear here today, uh, he didn't immediately say yes. Uh, he asked a little bit about the host. And he said that he's had some uneven experiences with uh, comedians in the past. And then I explained that you're a fellow New Jerseyan. You also grew up on a farm in New Jersey. Mm. Well, not, qu not quite. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> we visited Neptune, New Jersey. But, but. but you knew the story of Rusty's origin in Neptune Township, New Jersey. Wally Sharar so, is, I went to... Wally Schrar went to my high school, Dwight Mara High School. Uh -huh. Go ahead. So, I'm sorry. Rusty, you are in the company of a real fan, and uh, thank you for indulging us with your visit here today. So, it was two weeks ago that I attended the watch party hosted by the B612 Foundation, of which you are the chair emeritus, and uh, the Asteroid Institute that was at this fabulous bar at uh, Fort Mason, the interval here in San Francisco. And I, I wanna get to the DART mission and the effort to divert the orbit of the uh, little moonlet of, uh, of uh, uh, Dimorphos that rotates or you know, goes around uh, its uh, larger uh, uh, asteroid. But let's talk a little bit about your history, because you got a scholarship to MIT, you started flying, you drew the attention of NASA, you were one of the youngest people recruited, you ended up uh, in the Apollo program, and as David mentioned, you operated the lunar module. Uh, tell us a little bit about what experiences led you to your work of the last 20 years to prepare us for planetary defense, particularly from asteroids? Well, I think the most, um, the most significant uh, event or happening which led me uh, to have this rather specialized interest um, was in the mid 90s when uh, all of the various fields of exoplanets and you know things of that kind of uh, things beyond the earth let me just say that there are many 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 different small fields if you will or disciplines which kind of congealed all under one umbrella in the mid-90s um, called astrobiology. And uh, NASA, uh, w uh, under the um, leadership of a, of a particular guy whose name I forget at the time, who, who came in as an associate administrator of NASA, uh, brought every, all of that together, all of those different interests in one way or another of life or things beyond the planet into this field of astrobiology. And it, NASA basically took then the responsibility to uh, examine what, where is life? What is the extent of life? Where did life come from? How did it form? Did it come from, uh, did, did life here on Earth actually originate on Earth? Or in fact, did it, did it end up being, being transported? 
here to earth and flourish uh, in its own form on earth? Uh, where is it going? What are the limits to, to life on earth? I mean, we, we understand in you know, our daily lives what it's like, but uh, how, how salty can water be and still support life? How hot can water be and still support life? Uh, how cold, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we didn't know that much about the limits of life. Well, it was a very interesting transition that NASA made gathering all of this together in, in the field of astrobiology. One of the things which was very obvious uh, to anyone looking at it was that impacts of comets and asteroids on the early Earth had a tremendously powerful uh, pardon me, impact on the formation and development evolution of life. And in fact, uh, it's thought that most of the water on the planet Earth ended up from or originated from uh, comet and asteroid impacts. And certainly we know that a lot of the, uh, the carbonaceous uh, content out of which life really emerged and developed on Earth um, came with the asteroid and comet impacts that occurred uh, all through the history of, of Earth. And um, at one point, I was uh, go. I went to a lecture at the Morrison Planetarium in uh, at the University of California, the museum of, of uh, in Golden Gate Park. And the guy from uh, professor from Prince, I mean from uh, Stanford, was talking about the early impacts on Earth. And in particular, of course, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, the Ch Chicxulub impact, not only the dinosaurs, but 75% of all the species on Earth, uh, living species, uh, went extinct at, at that time because of that huge, that very large impact. And when he got into talking about and describing that impact, uh, of course, I, I'm a graduate of MIT, so I, you know, I studied uh, thermodynamics and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, at, at, toward the end of his lecture, he, he talked about the tremendous shock wave from this Chicxulub impact, which was probably an asteroid about uh, 10 kilometers in diameter. That's pretty big, seven miles or so in diameter. Um, and he talked about the shock wave and the tsunamis that occurred and all of that kind of thing, including throwing billions of billions of tons of material out of the earth to rain down around the earth, almost like millions of ICBMs coming in around the earth. And as they come into the atmosphere, they heat up, they glow, they explode even uh, from the heat. Um, the atmosphere became uh, so hot, uh, 1500 degrees or so, that all combustible material on the surface flashed into fires. And so now you had not only the dust and rock coming in from this tremendous explosion, uh, but you also had uh, smoke joining that. Uh, and, and therefore you ended up with a nuclear winter, as it were. Well, I had been familiar with all that anti-war activities and, and whatnot. But the thing that really got me was when he said that because of that tremendous atmospheric heat from all of this stuff re-entering, the atmosphere was so hot that it boiled off about one meter of sea level around the world. Now, I had a real... Um, understanding of the amount of energy it took to boil off, you know, a pot of water, let alone a meter reduction in sea level. That is yeah. an unbelievable amount of energy. I, that, that blew my socks. I mean, that, that, that wiped me out. So I got at that point, very interested in this whole issue of impacts. And at that time, or very shortly after that time, around the year 2000, um, we were finding, and when I say we, I'm talking about the astronomical community, we're finding more and more what are called near-Earth 
asteroids. That is, not asteroids that are out in the asteroid belt, you know, between Mars and Jupiter, uh, basically in circular or near circular orbits around the sun, but rather ones that swoop in and whose orbits come inside at one point, the orbit of the Earth and swing back out again uh, in, in most cases. Um, any of the asteroids which come across, whose orbits cross the orbit of Earth on the way in around the sun or come very, very near to it uh, are referred to as near Earth asteroids. And uh, that is what the Chicxulub impact uh, was, a, a, a very large uh, 10 kilometer asteroid. Um, so I got very interested at that point. Of course, it was related to the fact that I float, I'd flown on Apollo 9 and, and uh, my two compatriots and I, Dave Scott and Jim McDivitt, you know, would look at the Earth at night uh, when we were on the night side of the Earth. And I can recall when we were all three glued to the windows looking at the lightning flashes and the weather fronts and all of that. And every once in a while, you'd see a very dim streak of light. And it was almost as if you didn't see it. I mean, it was very, very subtle to the point where you didn't say anything. But then we sort of said, did, did anybody see a flash of light down there? You know, and said, yeah, yeah, I've seen those too. Well, and that's, that's the and only it, appropriate use of the term awesome, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, <laughs> this, is, this was so subtle, it wasn't awesome. Until yeah. we realized that what we were seeing in these little streaks of light were meteorites entering, shooting stars, entering the atmosphere, but they were below us, not up in the night sky, but down in the night sky. And of course, the immediate realization is, whoa, they had to come past us to get down there, you know? So, <laughs> uh, so there we were, um, you know, so there, there, is the, there are those two things which got me very interested in, in, in the idea of, of asteroids impacting the Earth. And again, as we're finding, as the community was finding more and more near Earth objects, and, and, and by the way, those are terms that are not quite interchangeable, near Earth object and near Earth asteroid. Uh, the near-Earth objects include near-Earth comets as well. And, but the best way to think about it is near-Earth objects, 95% or more of which are asteroids, and 5% uh, or so are near-Earth comets. Uh, but in, in either case, uh, they have a chance because they come across the Earth's orbit about 4% or 5% of those whose orbits come inside or closer to the sun than the Earth, their orbits come close enough to our, I mean, you can, you can picture that they're like this, but if they're at the, in the same plane, if they cross the plane of the Earth, a few of them have an intersection, their orbits intersect the Earth, and the closeness of the two orbits is less than uh, the radius of the Earth. And therefore, if the Earth is in that intersection, when the comet goes through the intersection, then we have a collision. And we realized that around the year 2000, that, that more and more of these things were being found, but nobody was doing anything about what do we do about it? Or can we do anything about it? So, so uh, Rusty, Rusty, just yeah. for a second, I want to mention that you are free to use as many space puns as <laughs> come, as come to mind, and you have a free license from the Carl Sagan Institute oh. to say to say billions and billions uh, <laughs> when, whenever billion. you like. <laughs> yeah, we all live through Carl's billions and billions. <laughs> But I, yeah, I Carl, mention... Carl is a good friend, and um, you, you know, uh, uh, I, I might mention David um, uh, from your prior session. Uh, I couldn't help thinking that uh, you know one of the early astronauts and uh, one of the astronauts who assisted me, frankly, in forming the Association of Space Explorers 
which is our professional uh, organization of astronauts and cosmonauts from around the world, was Prince um, uh, Bin Salman, uh, you know, and, and he was a, he was a very good friend. He he is a stepbrother of MBS, and uh, he was the first Saudi uh, and to the, to this date the only Saudi uh, astronaut. Um, but uh, uh, Sultan was, was is today a, a very good friend. But we, we can talk about that later. In I any event, so mention, we, uh, David. Yeah, go ahead, David. David. Uh, Rusty may want to bring some graphics in. Mm. So can you enable screen sharing? Yes, uh, yes. So that, that he yeah, can do good. that? Because, uh, Rusty, I, I want to turn to the uh, uh, events of two weeks ago, the DART yeah. mission. And one of the things that I learned from the commentary at the watch party from you and former astronaut Ed Liu and a little bit from former astronaut Steve Smith, Brian Mays on tour with Queen. He couldn't be there. He's on your board at B612. He's the uh, superstar in your little firmament. Uh, but one of the things that I learned was that NASA did not have a mission to conduct planetary defense. And it was the advocacy of you and Ed Liu that started in his kitchen with several bottles of wine about yeah. 20 years ago that led, <laughs> to the, that led to the formation of B612, which is named after the Little Prince, uh, and the uh, uh, efforts that you took on. You testified before Congress several times, notably yeah. in 2005, you uh, basic, yeah. basically put it on the agenda. And then finally, you got funding in about 2017. But part of that was resistance from the NASA bureaucracy saying, well, you know, we'd love to, Rusty, but it's not in our mission and we don't have a budget for it. Yeah. Well, I, and, and it's, it's a little less... Um, let me say uh, a little less their position than you describe it, Peter, in that uh, by law, uh, a, a federal agency is not permitted to request a budget, uh, to, to, to request money for something that it is not specifically authorized or directed to do in its in its uh, basic legislation in its founding legislation so nasa's responsibility up until we modified got it modified in in this instance was to conduct space science and exploration as well as aeronautics and a few other things but but in terms of space it was to to do science, space science, and exploration, as in human or other exploration, but not public safety. And when you're talking about deflecting or preventing asteroids from impacting the Earth and wiping out people and, and whole species, uh, it's an existential threat. But that's a public safety issue, in a way. It's, it's a cosmic public safety issue. But it's not space science. I mean, it, it, you know, it's it's an engineering activity. Uh, you know, you're you're pr you're protecting life. So that was a problem, and uh, we really uh, that NASA could not legally, basically, ask for a budget to do these things. That did not prevent the Congress, by the way, from telling NASA to do something. In fact, to discover. Uh, all of the astronauts over one kilometer in diameter by, uh, by 2008. They, they did that, in, they gave NASA 10 years to do that in 1998. Um, so, you know, the Congress could, could always tell NASA to do something that they weren't even authorized to do. And it always, to be frank about it, pissed NASA off because <laughs> what that meant was they didn't get any more budget but they had to take the money to do whatever they were directed to do out of their existing budget. So NASA was always opposed to this idea of taking action here and spending money to develop a, a, a planetary defense capability until we were able to modify the NASA uh, legislation so that they were 
responsible for developing the technology to do it. And even today, it's not explicit that NASA has a responsibility operationally to protect the Earth from asteroid impacts. That, that's still a, a little squirrely. But well, they do I'll, just, have... I'll just mention uh, a political yeah. comment that uh, the agency with an acronym that just has one fewer letters than NASA uh, has been very expansive in uh, <laughs> broadening its mission. And that's the NSA, the National Security Agency. <laughs> well, yeah, it, these things get changed and modified um, in, in many different ways. But uh, mm -hmm. in this particular case, um, NASA was not terribly happy to have this new assignment, even though I think most of the people in NASA understood that it was really important that people will die in the future as a result of impacts of asteroids on the Earth and, and, and millions of times. In fact, 100, 100 tons of asteroidal material enter into the Earth's atmosphere every night. People don't understand it's that large. They look up and they see shooting stars, which are, in fact, little bitty pieces of asteroids and comets. Uh, but they don't understand that they're seeing a very small percentage of them. You add that all around the world, you get about 100 tons coming in every night. Most of them are about the size of a grain of sand, but they get there are bigger ones out there too. And of course, the population drops off as you get to the larger sizes. So um, that's the real issue we're dealing with. Something some people may be interested in is that the minimum size of an asteroid which will create enough energy release on the ground that it could kill people is about 20 meters in diameter 60 65 feet in diameter the size of a house think think of it that way something coming in the size of a house or a bit bigger you know a mansion that's what is capable of creating death on the ground. And above that, of course, it, it goes on to, you know, wiping out species on the whole, on the whole planet, you know, when you get up to 10 kilometers, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. And, and Rusty, one of the achievements that uh, you have helped foster, you, you don't seem to want to take direct credit for things, so I won't uh, load that on you, but B612 and your colleagues, uh, these efforts have led to an inventory of asteroids that could potentially uh, hit the Earth. And that seems to be a really great leap forward in understanding the nature of the threat and being able to assess the risk of an Earth impact from a specific asteroid. Yeah. Um, let me let me try to give you a snapshot of that. There is a clearinghouse, a, a uh, the clearinghouse for the entire planet for tracking for for inventorying all of the asteroids, the near Earth asteroids that are discovered by hundreds of telescopes around the world every night. Every night there are literally thousands of observations made from hundreds of telescopic sites looking for and in particular ones that haven't been seen before. And any time, uh, every morning, uh, every, every telescope around the world ends up sending in these observations to the Minor Planet Center at, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard University. Uh, and the Minor Planet Center, or MPC, um, inventories all of these asteroids that are found and computes their orbits. Um, and they're not always terribly accurate. I mean, after one night of observing, there's a lot of uncertainty in the orbit, uh, but it's put out on the internet every night. By the way, all of this is wide open. 
not this is not uh, you know secret information or anything of that kind. Uh, you and I, anybody can literally look at the Minor Planet Center site, get all this information. It comes out every night. It, and it is that the first thing time. you do? Is that the first thing you do every morning? You pull out your iPad um, and check the MPC? You know, every every morning, yeah, every morning. <laughs> Peter, you're, you know too much here. Um, <laughs> every morning, part of my routine, frankly, as I crank up my computer, is to look to see, have there been any new near-Earth ob objects discovered, and in particular, ones that have a relatively high probability over the next hundred years of impacting the earth. And we, we now know of thousands, tens of thousands of near earth objects. And there are uh, on the order of, uh, I think it's 4,000, I could look it up here, but uh, you know, it, it, it is in a table every morning. I look at it to see if there are any new ones. The ones that I guess I would say are of even the most mild concern, there are on the order of 20 of them. They, they have greater than a one in a million chance of impact in the earth in the next hundred years, okay? And, and of a size that could actually do damage on the ground. So that's about the level of, uh, of concern. But at any moment, you know, one could be discovered, which, uh, in fact, uh, could be uh, scheduled for an impact a, a year or two from now. What do you uh, so do? Russ, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. David. So what happens? You see something coming and it's we've got two years. Yeah. Well, is, I mean, what do you do? You know, if, if it's two years away, there's not a lot you can do. Uh, but frankly, what we do when we discover a new asteroid, we determine whether or not its, as its orbit is close enough when it, as it crosses the Earth's orbit, okay, that, going like this. As, the, as it crosses the Earth's orbit, if the sun is over there, okay, if it crosses the Earth's orbit from outside in, um, then um, the question is how far apart are those two orbits when you turn it down, okay? If they are very close, like the diameter of the Earth, then there is a potential impact. That happens about 4 to 5%. You know, we forecast for the next 100 years. And if at any time in that 100 years, there is an, there is an intersection where both the Earth and the asteroid are in the intersection at the same time, that is an impact. So uh, again, and, and, count, and, and based upon the accuracy of the, our knowledge of the orbit, of course, we don't know precisely that the asteroid is going to be there. The asteroid over time is sort of a smeared, it's a line. It, it, it's not just a point because we don't have a perfect orbit. You never have perfect information in any science. And Rusty, one of the so what things you can that do is you... calculate a probability of of an impact, and that is put into the table by the Minor Planet Center every morning, and that's what it is I look at and what we're concerned. About. But if you and know, about four percent it... of those asteroids that we know of uh, in the next hundred years have a non-zero probability of impacting the Earth, but it may only be one in ten thousand or one in a million or something like that. But in the movie, Don't Look Up, if if yeah. we have some lead time, and this, yeah. I guess, is what DART is all about, but exactly. like right now, if today we discovered we've got two years, what, what would you recommend? Num number one, we've screwed up because what we should have is decades of warning. In other words, what we want to do is build an inventory of all of the near-Earth objects that are out there that can be harmful, okay, and be able to predict their orbits 100 years ahead of time. So we look, we have a, a vision, a, a sort of time horizon of about 100 years once we discover these asteroids. We don't find them just as they're coming in to hit the Earth. We find them out there in space like other planets and we can predict their orbit. 
And so what we're looking for is to have the knowledge of where these guys are, a complete inventory and the knowledge of where they're going so that we will know decades ahead of time whether an object is going to hit the Earth or has a high enough probability to hit the Earth that we should do something about it. And that, to do something about it, which is what all DART and everything, you know, that, that's where the action is. To do something about it, you need on the order of five to 10 years, something like that to take action. Because we can forecast that far ahead once we know the orbit of an asteroid. And it takes about a couple of years to get the equipment ready to the launch vehicle, the impacting spacecraft that we'll use to hit it and to change its orbit. Um, and to launch it, to rendezvous with it, to impact it, and then for that impact to take enough effect over time that it will cause the asteroid to miss the Earth instead of hitting it. Well, how did we do? How did we do? Well, well wait a minute, thing. wait a minute. Oh, 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 okay. You're really Peter, we're getting ahead of you. <laughs> I want to know can if you, we're going to live. Can you mute the host, please? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. I, I wanted to point out just briefly that one of my takeaways from the watch party was a point that you made that yeah. once we have a, a projected trajectory, yeah. uh, it becomes a thorny political question. Because if it is projected to hit David's high-rise apartment in Manhattan overlooking the air shaft, uh, we would expend all kinds of resources. But to quote a former president, if it is projected to hit a shithole country somewhere, then the global community might not want to do much to prevent that. Yeah, you're, you're raising um, a very, very thorny issue which is the geopolitical component of the overall planetary defense uh, issue. Uh, now, I, Peter, I'm going to I'm going to ask if we can put off a little bit on that. Let, let me let me before we get into uh, actually my favorite element of this, which is the geopolitical. Uh, let, let, let me let me first start sharing a screen. Because what I want to do is, is give people a, a sense of the technical, physical things that, that we do in order to protect the Earth. Now, okay. again, we have uh, two things. If, if this is the Earth's orbit, let's say the sun is over here. Okay, so this is the Earth going, ar going around uh, like this, around the sun. And the asteroid is also going around the sun, but let's say it crosses the Earth's orbit from the outside in. There are other orb other asteroids, of course, that, that can cross from the inside out. So the asteroid can actually come from the outside in toward the sun, or it can be heading outward toward aphelion. Well, I don't want to get too technical on things, but anyway, it can cross the Earth's orbit either way. Now, what we want to do, because what, we, what we're going to see is that these, every year, the Earth is in that intersection. Once a year, the Earth goes through that point. Now, the orbit of the asteroid may be two years long, okay? So it's only once every two years that the, Earth, that the asteroid goes through there, okay? But sooner or later, the Earth and the asteroid, if that's a real intersection, a three-dimensional they'll be there at the same time so what we want to do is to interrupt that rendezvous now the way to do that is not as most people think to change the direction of the asteroid that's extremely hard to do it, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to change the direction an asteroid is going but what's relatively easy to do is to change the speed that it's going. In other words, we can hit it from the back, run into it from the rear, or we can run into it from the front to slow it down. We can speed it up or slow it down. And what that does is it makes the orbit, if I run into it from the back, from, for example, and speed it up, it's going to end up in a bigger orbit around the sun than it was in. 
and that will take longer to get around. And therefore, it will end up being late for the rendezvous. Or if I hit it from the front and slow it down, it's going to end up in a smaller orbit around the sun, and it will go around faster, and it will end up going through the intersection before the Earth gets there. Okay? So that's what we want to do. They were going to hit be in the intersection at the same time, and what we do by a kinetic impact hitting it is to cause it to be early or late. If it's early, it gets through the intersection before the Earth arrives, or if it's late, the Earth gets through the intersection before the asteroid arrives. What I'd like to do, I'm going to try to screen share. <laughs> this, this, is, this may be a real grab bag here, but let, let's give it okay. a go. Okay, so go ahead. I'm, going to, I'm going to share the screen. And what we did in the DART mission, okay, I'm going to say, let me see what we got here. I'm going to go to, okay, this one and share. And let's see, there we are. And I'm going to go there and there. And that should go to a full screen. It is. And what we're looking at here is the target for the DART mission. This is the, this is actually a binary, not just one asteroid, but a binary asteroid. And I'll explain why that is the target rather than just a lonely asteroid. But this is the main asteroid of the pair, which is called Didymus. And this one going around it is Dimorphus. This is about 600 feet across or 167 meters in diameter. And this one's, I, I don't know, five times that large or something like that. And this, these are the actual images here. I'm going to start this thing. Okay, so these are this is these are the last images coming into the um, the binary pair, and what we're headed for is this smaller asteroid. We're going to run into this head on. It's coming at us here. So we're going to run into it to slow it down in its orbit around the larger companion. And there you go, there are the last images before the impact. And at the, at the top there, you can partial download uh, of the image. Uh, but that, that was what happened um, the other day. Now I'm gonna shrink that one down. And here I think you can see, let me see if I can get this one bigger. Uh, let me go to full screen here, okay. So this is Didymus. This is the larger of are, the are two. Are we seeing that? Uh, are you seeing that? Yeah, Rusty, we have a frozen image from the uh, the red screen after impact. Oh, really? Okay. Now let's see why. And while you're that. while you're fixing that, I'll just mention <laughs> to to people who are listening to this as an audio podcast that you should go to YouTube and uh, locate today's uh, show in video form. And then you'll be able to see uh, Rusty's uh, uh, videos that he's sharing. Right, and can I just have a once in a lifetime opportunity to say to Rusty Schweigert, don't panic. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> there. Okay, great. There, I'm not panicked. <laughs> Ooh, look so, at this. so you should wow. be seeing the diagram now. Is that true? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So so here is Didymus uh, and and Dimorphos, which is a binary asteroid. Two of them. The smaller one, the, you know, they go around each other, but uh, obviously the big one has got the most gravity. And here is the orbit. You can see it going around the top here, the the white line. And uh, here is the DART spacecraft coming in and hitting it head on. It's coming around here, and we're going to hit it. And they, we dropped off a little spacecraft called Lycia, which is an, an Italian contribution to the program, which dropped away from DART and, and began trailing behind it. And it had a camera in it so that we could take pictures. And uh, you can see that uh, Dimorphos comes around, and we hit it at this point, 
And now, because it's going slower, it's going to end up in a smaller orbit around Didymos. And so this is the object because what we're interested in is how effective is that impact? How, how um, you know, we, we've got a bunch of momentum here, the, the mass times the velocity of this DART spacecraft running into this object here, this rock. Uh, is going to is going to put a lot of momentum into it. It's actually going to reduce the momentum of Dimorphos around Didymos, therefore resulting in a smaller orbit. But we don't know how effective that is, and that's the reason for doing this experiment to understand how much of that momentum can be transferred. And two things happen if you if you picture this being a marshmallow then running into a marshmallow, and this is huge in comparison to the size of the spacecraft, even though it hits it at 10,000 miles an hour or 6,000 miles an hour, and it weighs, you know, a ton or something like that, that's minuscule compared with Dimorphos. So what we expected to happen is that if it absorbs all of the momentum of this incoming object of, of our DART spacecraft, it will change the period of that satellite asteroid around Didymos from about 11, let's say 12 hours, which is the original orbit period, to about 10, uh, 11 hours and 10 minutes, about 10 minute change in the period of the orbit. And by being able to measure that by seeing the light reflected from this pair of objects. Uh, we can see when they occlude one another, when they go in front of one another, looking at them from the Earth, there's a dip in the brightness of the combination. And we will be able to tell by watching the timing between those dips in the, in the brightness, what the period, what the change in this period was, and therefore how effective this impact was. So, because Rusty, based, based on the data that's been collected yeah. in the two weeks since the impact, did you win your bet with Ed Liu? We don't know yet. We're not uh. going to do that, <laughs> Peter. Well, um, I, I don't want to get... Explain the wager before you... Yeah, I'll explain the, the wager. Question. Okay, Ed, Ed Liu and I were, were co-founders, uh, along with Pete, of B612 Foundation. And Ed and I agree on 99% of things, but we have differences of opinion <laughs> on a few. And uh, I have always had the opinion that the amount of momentum that gets transferred to uh, during an impact is a bit less than what other people have been thinking. Now, there are two components to the momentum that gets transferred to this uh, object when you run into it. The momentum of the spacecraft itself is going to end up, I mean, it's going to end up being zero. It's going to hit that thing and, you know, and all of the momentum is going to be transferred to the, uh, to the asteroid. But in addition to the momentum of DART being transferred, it's also going to splash out a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to create a crater, and it's going to throw a lot of stuff out of that crater. And ejecta. Stuff, ejecta, right. And that we love ejecta, that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that ejecta, some of it, is going to go backwards. It's going to be splashed out in the direction from which DART came in for the impact. And if that ejecta gets, uh, if there's a lot of ejecta and it's heavy and, and a lot of it at high velocity, that's like a rocket plume coming out. So you get what we call a momentum multiplier because of the ejecta going back out in the direction that this thing came in. And Ed, and that momentum multiplier is how much do you multiply the momentum that, that this object has coming in? How much do you multiply it by? Do you multiply it by 10 or 20 percent? Do you multiply it by a factor of two or three, you know, two or three hundred percent? 
you know, and Ed, I, I, I figured it'd be about 1.2 or, or uh, the, 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 this term called beta. In other words, we would end up with about 1.2 times the incoming momentum transferred to the object. Ed thought it would be three, a factor of three, 300%. I figured it'd be a 20% increase. And Ed must not have heard me when I said that I thought it would be only about 1.2. And he offered to bet with me at dinner based on whether or not it would exceed three, 300 percent instead of 20 percent. Mm -hmm. I don't know what got into Ed's mind. I don't think he heard me, <laughs> but I was very happy to take a bet <laughs> that it will be less than 300 percent uh, momentum multiplier. Um, but that's the reason we're doing this, because when if you picture this is the earth now, uh, I don't want to do that. Let me just, uh, I'm going to, I'll cancel, stop sharing here so you can look at me. Okay. And if you, if you look at me here and you see the earth and th th think of yourself as an asteroid coming for an impact on the earth. Okay. So you're seeing the earth out there in front of you. And the plane of the, of the orbit that you're in around the sun, Okay, you're in the plane, so you're looking at a line that goes through the earth. That plane cuts through the earth, or you're not going to hit the earth. The plane goes through the earth, it makes a line that cuts the earth. Okay? And that line is called the risk corridor. If I'm going to hit the earth, I'll hit somewhere on that line. But in general, we don't know if I'm going to hit the earth or if I'm going to be on the line out here or on the other side of the earth. In other words, that line goes not only across the earth, but it goes out both sides. And I may, I, it's, it's an open question whether I'm going to hit the earth itself or somewhere else. This is all in the uncertainty involved in how accurately we can track and predict an orbit of, a, of an asteroid. So, at the time we have to spend a billion dollars to deflect this asteroid, we will not know for certain whether it's going to hit the Earth or whether it's going to miss it. Okay, now think of that. There's your geopolitical decision. Somebody's got to des decide to spend somebody's billion dollars. Who's billion dollars? Okay, US, Russia, the country that's most likely to be hit, but you know, there are 10 countries along that line all the way across the earth. And you don't even know where it's gonna hit, if it's gonna hit. So who pays for that? Who makes that decision? Yeah. Who handles it? Okay, now here's the tough part. If we don't hit it with enough energy, instead of moving it off the earth, so it, it was gonna hit in the middle of the earth, we hit it with enough impact, we transfer enough momentum to it, it ends up over here. But if we hit it with too little energy, it goes from here to here on the Earth. So instead of hitting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it hits in Nicaragua or China or somewhere else, which was not in danger initially. So what we want to do is we want to hit it with enough momentum that it ends up knocking it all the way off the earth, okay? And we can either slow it down so it passes after the earth has gone through the intersection, or we can speed it up, in which case it ends up over on this side of the earth, okay? So along this line, there are 10 nations, let's say, or 15 nations, depending upon the line, it could be a lot of nations. And let's say it was gonna hit in the middle, if it doesn't get all the way off the earth, it's going to hit somebody who wasn't initially in danger. Mm -hmm. So the people on this side of the earth say, oh, knock it that way. And the people on this side of the earth say, oh, knock it that way, right? Well, who decides that? That's where the United Nations comes in. That's where the geopolitical decision making to act comes in. But technically, we need to understand what this factor beta is so that we give it enough energy to get it off the earth. So if Ed is right, you know, it's not going to take a lot of energy to get it off the earth. If I'm right, you may move it too little. You, be, you better you better hit it with a bigger spacecraft 
or hit it faster, right? So right. that's the reason why this test is so important because we need to know how powerful one of these impacts actually is to make sure that we hit an asteroid that's actually coming for us with enough energy, with enough momentum to make it miss the Earth entirely. So Rusty, I want to I want to introduce you to my colleague here on the podcast. She is an actual physicist, Professor Marianne Cummings. An actual physicist! Wow. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <Hey, Marianne. laughs> teaching uh, astronomy um, courses a few years back at, at uh, Northern Illinois University, and that was a real education for me. I don't know so much about my students, but you know because. I never took an astronomy class in college. <laughs> I mean, all the astronomy I learned was reading Scientific American and Astronomy Today. And, yeah, that's you know, where I started. So, no, but it's actually uh, it's actually fantastic. It's a fantastic way to introduce physics to kids who are not going to yeah. be scientists. You know? Absolutely. And, but you might actually get a couple or one or two per class interested in doing that. And, oh, um, absolutely. The, and then, and of course, one of the things I chose because I've been kind of working cosmology into you know my lectures all along was to do the astrobiology section. Uh, <laughs> right. And I was like stunned. I'd never seen the Drake's equation before. And wow. Uh, I thought it was about time I go to the damn website. I heard about it, and and, and what well, at that time was a few years ago. And already the the catalog of um, identified planets was just grow, growing by leaps and bounds. I think the first exoplanet was discovered in 1995, and since then, literally thousands. And uh, yeah, I mean, like of the eight or so terms in that Drake equation, you know, four actually have things you can write with error bars that aren't ridiculous you know so i'm going whoa this is like becoming a reality here and uh yeah. you know, and Marianne, so let me let me just yeah. jump in for people who yeah. don't know the drake equation i just looked it up <laughs> it's a probabilistic argument used to estimate the number of active communicative extraterrestrial civilizations in the milky way galaxy Please possible. continue. Yeah, possible. Well, I think it, it wasn't uh, Carl. It in respect to the Milky Way. Yeah, but well, it's you know, the probab it's the probability that we're not the only life in the universe, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. that there is but other life to, in the universe. But we're going to be sampling, you know, mo from the Milky Way, you know, because so considering that yeah. the Milky Way is somewhat representative representative of what goes on all over the universe in terms of galaxies, but. Um, yeah, and this is fascinating because, you know, you, you get to kind of talk about ridiculous yet, you know, sort of relevant topics that people don't think of before. And, you know, for instance, uh, there, there's two things, but I'd like to ask you because you probably have more uh, practical, I've thought about this more practically. One of the things that's remarkable is the contention that because we have like big gassy planets, notably Jupiter, outside of the Earth's orbit, that that basically allows life to be able to evolve because instead of getting the big reset every like 65 million years or so, <laughs> um, if you didn't have those planets deflecting asteroids, you'd be giving them every million years or half million years, in which case you could never have a long enough, stable enough ecosystem for advanced uh, evolution to go on. Hmm. And uh, do you now have you uh, do, do you have any experience with that? It, it seems a little improbable until and this is my second question. Um, what are the uh, the what are the angles of, of a typical asteroid compared to the plane of the orbits of our uh, of our Earth around the sun? Are they kind of close? Is it all collinear or are the asteroids? Do they have, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm asking. Yeah. Are, are they mostly within, you know, a small uh, angular range? Well, let me let me let me go to the second part first because that's a technical issue, and I can answer it very rapidly, and uh, and, and then get on to what is for me much more interesting, which is the first part of your question. Um, so, so the, the most of the asteroids are uh, coplanar with the with the basic plane of the planets, the ecliptic plane, 
um, uh, around the sun. I mean, uh, you know, the dust, the, the dust that was formed and the formation of the planetary systems is dominated by the angular momentum of the cloud which can, uh, of dust and gas which converges and ends up forming the star in the middle and you end up with basically a plane of gas and dust which uh, end up forming planets around any star planetary system and the, and the asteroids are basically left over the leftover material largely because of Jupiter mucking things up and, and not allowing uh, planets to form too close to it. Um, and, and those phenomena, the, the, all of those factors are true in one way or another in any star system, uh, planetary system that forms in, in the universe. Uh, uh, there are always variations and the planets migrate in and out from their star in the formation process and things impact, etc., etc. But basically, the, the uh, asteroids are coplanar in the ecliptic. Um, but, you know, the ones that we're discovering now, I mean, we've discovered most of the large ones. The, the only large ones that we continue to discover the ones that are like 30 degrees to that uh, ecliptic plane. I mean, that's those are the only large ones that we find now. We found most of them because they're in the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they're at a fairly high angle, they're much harder to find. Um, so we find those last. But I want to go to the first part of, of, of your question because that is, to me, what we ought to be having this conversation about. Pardon me, David and, no. and Peter. <laughs> We're about to take over your program. Good, good. Um, take it. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, what is interesting um, is that if you look at big history, which is essentially the history from the Big Bang, to now. It is the biggest of histories. It is from what we know as the origin or the Big Bang to the current time. And if you look at that, I mean, you started out with a quantum soup of quarks and stuff, you know, extremely hot and extremely uh, compact. And that ex expanded very rapidly. I don't want to go into all the crap, but let me just say that it went as things expanded and cooled off, you went from a quark soup to individual uh, nucleons, protons, and electrons, and you know a few other species. Um, and as things expanded and cooled, they formed into the basic elements, and in particular hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium in the beginning. And those things got together and formed the first stars. Uh, out of those stars, they would they would burn up the, the nuclear fuel and create heavier species within them. They would then explode, and then they started populating the universe with oxygen and nitrogen and other things. So if you look at that time history, and it's going out from the Big Bang in all directions, you start with quarks, you end up with, you, you go next to elements, you then form molecules, uh, you, you form stars, you form galaxies. That basic physics moves out until such time as things get cool enough that what you're beginning to do is have these different elements, now some of them heavy, forming molecules and complex molecules. And as you go out in time from that big bang, that molecular stuff begins to form what we call chemistry. And then chemistry continues to evolve out further in dark clouds of gas and dust. And, uh, with a, a transition we really don't understand yet, but it is that transition from chemistry to biology. Wow. So you had quarks to physics to chemistry to biology. Wow. And that was a phenomenal transition. Because up until then, quarks, physics, 
chemistry don't give a damn about anything. But biology wants to live, wants to survive, wants to reproduce. It is fundamental to biology. And out of that come the higher forms of consciousness and intelligence and self-awareness and all of that. But that's a process of which we are an extremely unique small part on a planet around the sun. But it has to have been replicated billions of times, pardon me, Carl Sagan, billions, <laughs> millions of times, you know, throughout this universe. I'll be a little bit of a contrarian because I do. <laughs> it, all right. By the way, that because was, it, I, excuse me for one second. That was amazing. I mean, yes. that just, that was for, that was. for, for idiots that, like me. What David, you just that said. is, that is what fascinates me. And in particular, mm -hmm. because we beginning with Apollo now are, have, are being born out of the birth canal of mother earth. That's when human consciousness first went outside the birth canal of Mother Earth, Gaia, out to the moon, my buddies, you know, Bill Anders and, and Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. And lo and behold, to their surprise, they weren't even expecting it, turned their spacecraft around and, and the Earth came up over the horizon of the moon. And that's that iconized photograph. And that is the first time that life, as we know it, realized that it was now moving out from the birth canal into the, into the larger cosmos. And, and like any child them. or any, any, anything that is born, any life that is born, the potential is all after that birth moment. And that's that's the moment of history that we are involved in. And that, to me, is what all of this stuff that we're doing is all about. Now, you know, the planetary defense thing, that's just an existential threat that we are now able to influence by by reshaping the solar system to enhance human survival. Hmm. But we are part of this great experiment in life and and it happen you know in our lifetimes i interrupted you professor marianne i'm sorry no, no that that, yeah, that, yeah. Was, please, that was please great. come back with your contrarian <laughs> no that's a big question i mean because yeah. david asked you know about you know what we would be discovering with the james uh webb telescope which i think is going to be a profound scientific i mean the the data that we are going to see from that is profound one of the more disturbing things is what we may not see, at least not immediately, is any sign of life like ourselves. Because yeah. there is a big question with all, you know, there is there there are theories in physics about all the evolution that you just described, except for one. And that is when when we had life, you know, when we, we had the amino acids, I, I mean, the, those got those molecules uh, happen and they probably happen all over the universe. But when do you get a replicating form that you would call life? And that's my question is, yeah. is DNA just an accident of a big chemical accident that happened on planet earth or on some asteroid that's crash landed into planet earth? Or is DNA, is there some principle, organizing principle of chemistry and physics that makes DNA inevitable? Well, I don't you, know. You know Marianne, the, 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 to, to, to me, the general uh, answer to your question, uh, or, or let me say, the contrarian thought to your contrarian position, <laughs> <laughs> is that, first of all, we're dealing with a limited number of elements and mm -hmm. combinations of those elements um, that all relate to physical things of, of temperature and pressure and things of that kind. And uh, improbable though certain things may be, when you multiply them by the number of planets in the universe. And what would that number be, out, sir? You know, 
10 to the 23rd or something like that. I mean, it's a yeah. humongous number. <laughs> yeah. And so the probability that we're the yeah. only ones who have, uh, you know, come out of that soup as intelligent beings, uh, that we're the only ones is so improbable that while we may never see it in our lifetimes, I have little doubt that that this that life is built into the fundamental nature of of the universe. I, I, I cannot but believe that the universe uh, that life is inevitable given the fundamental nature of the universe as we know it. Yeah. Now you know, you can go to multiple universes if you want. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's enough wrestling with the one that we know about. But, uh, but the probabilities are so low that we're the only life form that I can't deal yeah. with it at all. And of course, you know, we haven't even, that's just only considering carbon-based life forms. I mean... Well, that, in- I, I I wouldn't restrict it to that. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't I don't for a minute think that we are you know the the dominant form <laughs> of life. Yeah, you, I mean, just, maybe that space uh, travel might be a problem for us. What somebody described us talking meat <laughs> creatures, <laughs> where somebody something based more reasonably like on silicon, you know, not so, having. But- but if, Mary, if I, here's, if I here's, may, here's, here's, just for a yeah, second, go ahead, Rusty, oh, okay. uh, sure. I'm sorry, I have to go to another Zoom call, and I it's going to be much more boring than this, but <laughs> yeah. I want to say three things. One is, it appears that the book of Genesis is packed with lies. Mm. Uh, number two, <laughs> I hope that I am as sharp as you at age 86. <laughs> really? And number, wow. and number three... Uh, don't let these knuckleheads keep you up all night. They will go forever. And when when you've had enough, just say, I got to go. Okay. Thank you, Rusty. Well, I, this is a fun conversation. Peter, thank you very much thank for you, Peter, passing because- on the invitation to me. Uh, thank you. It's it's my pleasure. Pete, it's before you go, Peter, Peter, before you go, yeah. you know, this. I, I'm, I've been very angry. I paid too much for this pair of shoes that I bought <laughs> yesterday. And I'm starting to think it may not matter. Here we go. <laughs> In the scheme of things, maybe it's maybe I shouldn't be worrying about what I paid for those shoes. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Oh. Please, thank All you. Right. Yeah. Carry on. Big, big thoughts. You. Big thoughts are made up of a whole bunch of little ones. So that's <laughs> right. a, it's okay. <laughs> uh, here's here's what I'll do. I, my goal is to have you and Peter want to come back. So. That, that's the smartest thing. So why don't we do this? Why don't, uh, this is incredible. And I, and if, if why, why, why don't I let Mar- Professor Marianne ask you a couple of questions and then hopefully you'll, you'll want to come back. This is great. Uh, tremendous. So oh, it's, it, it, it's fine. This, this subject is so yes interesting. And I believe more than interesting, it has, at least for me, and, and, and I'm speak, I can only speak personally, but for me, the sense that I have of the life experiment of which we are a part yeah. is so such a precious thing. It is part, it seems to me, of the, of the fundamental plan of the universe built into it. And here we are, just this unique one that comes out of Mother Earth, mm-hmm. But it seems to me that we have a responsibility to see this experiment continue. And so to me, this recognition is part, is the front end of an obligation to see that the earth continues supporting life. I mean, we get right into climate and all kinds of, you know, very real things. Um, and that is part of our obligation as part of life to see that, that this experiment, it's not going to be us. When we're not going to recognize the long-term future of human life. I, you know, I got another, if I'm really lucky, I got another 10 years on this planet. <laughs> but, 
but we collectively are an experiment, a great experiment in life. And I think we are one of a community of life, some of which is out there and has probably run into each other, you know, but we're here. We are about to emerge out of the birth canal of Gaia. Yeah. And, and we, we've had a first go at it. Yeah, I think, I think it's kind of hard that. to to under it, it's really hard to overstate how important that image of planet Earth was. You know, we yeah. had imagined it before, but the first time somebody that was the first time somebody saw Earth from that position ever. Exactly. Can you, Professor exactly. Marianne, can you imagine being the three guys who had to follow that in Apollo nine? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the the big the, the big deal from the that? standpoint of, of of everyday stuff is is the landing and Neil Armstrong running around. To me, it's what Marianne just said. It's the first human consciousness recognizing this reality, and that's Apollo eight, not Apollo eleven. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I've always seen Apollo eight as as the real. Tur turning point the real point was that the first that was the first mission that made an orbit around that orbited the moon right right yeah yeah, yeah. it was in fact your mission was supposed to Came be back apollo, in earth orbit yeah your mission apollo 9 was supposed to be apollo 8 but they were afraid the russians were going to get there <laughs> for right didn't they speed it up well uh, you know that's much too complicated to go into david but uh, you know i at that time, so many things were changing, right. of course, with the Apollo fire and everything else. I mean, things were moving back and forth. We had five different missions before we flew. You know, right. Four of them changed to other things. So, I mean, it was a, a big difference. But for me, on Apollo 9, following Apollo 8, and, and one of my best friends, personal friends, uh, Bill Andrews, was uh, you know on the Apollo 8 mission. And so in preparation for the mission, I had, you know, done a lot of thinking and blah, blah, blah. In any event, while I was outside, I was testing the, the new Apollo suit and I did the first EVA, extravehicular, you know, spacewalk, if you will, outside in with the new suit and the backpack, which my buddies ran around on the moon with afterward, right? So I tested that stuff. And while I was outside getting ready to do this, you know, crossover from one spacecraft to the other, blah, 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 the movie camera that Dave Scott was using to capture my motion, my transfer, uh, failed. It's a German Mauer movie camera, if you're interested in what failed. <laughs> but uh, Jim McDivitt gave him five minutes to try and fix the camera so that he could get do do this movie uh, uh you know of my motions and it didn't work he he could he never got it fixed but i had five minutes jim mcdivitt said hey rusty stay right there and i was part way up a handrail on the front of the lunar module and i just said to myself somehow i said this is my time this five wow. minutes i'm going to be i'm not going to be an astronaut i'm a human being let this come in and I just I held on to the handrail with one hand and I just swung around and I looked at where the hell I was. I mean, it was just, you know, incredible. And I just said, let this really questions came up like, how did I get here? What's really going on? What what is happening? And I I realized I'm part of humanity and i'm like the sensing element at the moment of humanity out at this frontier and my responsibility is to bring this back to to humanity and uh, i mean it it was a very important five minutes and dave you know dave didn't get the camera fixed and jim said okay let's get back to the checklist and it was over but i mean that five minutes was you know very special I probably wouldn't be saying the kind of stuff I'm saying if right. it weren't for that failed movie camera. <laughs> uh, I'm going to 
Uh, there's so many things I want to ask you because I, 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 I well, but you I got I, other guests. I, yeah, I, no, no, I want I want to share you with Professor Marianne. And yeah. so Professor Marianne. Yeah. What do your students what do your students think about all this? Or what do you think that they think? Well, I about? haven't taught for a few years, but at the time, I mean, it was what was great about teaching astronomy, because even a few years ago, there was like that Rosetta mission that was landing on the asteroid, of, you know, that had been launched 10 years before and managed to land on this thing going like 60,000 miles an hour. I mean, there was like everything there. Oh yeah, and uh, I think uh, the Voyager, both both of them, had officially yeah. left the building. And if you would have asked me what the you know what what's the end of the solar system, I, before I taught this class, I would have had no idea. I don't know the Oort clouds out there. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. But it was basically the official end of the solar system is where the solar wind, which is the radiation protons and things from the sun, hits with the interstellar gas so we're Medium, dominated right. by solar wind within the within the solar system and then there's this transition period where you know the momentum of the ejecta of the sun and the radiation of the sun is on par with that of just the interstellar interstellar gas and uh and then they left and i was so enthralled with with voyager because to me that was probably the single most successful successful scientific thing ever done and, and it's was, still going and it's still going and and, and it was supposed to be a five year mission but they just decided the you know the scientists and, and engineers over at the jet propulsion lab just said well we're going to make this sucker you know like last for as long as it could possibly last right and it's just and fascinating that it's still, still doing it. that they're still able to like get efficiencies out of the system to keep that you know sending sending data back to us so you know this yeah. is uh and and i think this saves the earth when somebody asks me about why are we doing this stuff i mean my standard answer why do because i'm a, a particle physicist uh but you know why what good is this stuff and my honest answer was the standard answer is we have no earthly idea because we have no idea what inventions come from you know we had no idea when people were discovering quantum mechanics that was just a fascinating you know little uh scientific exercise and then within Science like within fiction. 30 years <laughs> yeah so, but but within 30 years we had the the transistor you know and you know okay general relativity well that's very interesting what earthly good is it well your gps system wouldn't work unless you had einstein's general relativity to you know do the do the corrections for the for something being outside or, or farther away from the center of the earth's gravitational pull all this kind of stuff but and now we so have gravitational that. wave detectors oh that was my my old advisor talk about somebody who's really going strong in their 80s my yeah. my advisor had the pinnacle of his life because he and he was never a tenured professor <laughs> he was he's uh still at university of michigan but he was the senior guy on the uh, ligo experiment from michigan and he was the guy doing the optics yeah which Whoa. is an insane uh, incredible mean, the 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 kind of like Distance is like a fraction of a size of a freaking quark or something or a proton accuracy in terms David, of the David, this is this is the subject right now here. This is something which people have no idea. I mean, these are mirrors in, mm -hmm. in orthogonal paths that are three kilometers long. OK, and they got mirrors at either end and you bounce a laser off these things. And what you're doing with those laser things through interferometry is you're you're measuring the length between between these two mirrors on each of those two legs, okay? And this instrument is able to detect a change in the length of this three kilometer long path that's equal to one ten thousandth of the diameter of a neutron. You get that one ten thousandth of the diameter change in length, and they can measure it. I know the equivalent of that is is the distance to the nearest star. Okay, if the distance to the nearest star changed by the width of one of the hairs on your head, that you get, 
Now we are able to measure that kind of minuscule change in length. And what that says is that the universe is vibrating as two black holes converge trillions of miles away. I mean, and, and way, from more that, amazing, that. more amazing than that yet yeah. is that a guy named Einstein with mathematics predicted that that would be the case a hundred years ago. And, and they timed the through. paper to come out on the hundredth anniversary of the, of his general yeah. relativity paper where he predicted I mean, gravity waves. Unbelievable. That, that is phenomenal. I mean, I mean, if you want to talk about science being amazing, I mean, right. <laughs> gravitational and that, was, you know, and that was just, and you know the story of that, that was just a calibration run. I mean, they were yeah, just- Yeah, right. Yeah, they- That was yeah. just a calibration run. And then they get a signal that stood out like the Eiffel Tower and they thought it was fake. In fact, they there was a, it took them a long uh, while to decide it wasn't. The guy from University of Michigan got a knock literally on the door at like midnight from guys from the Department of Energy, you know, like interrogating right. him because he was in charge of the data acquisition system, all that kind of stuff. But what they didn't know is that they were thought that they would be two neutron stars, which were big enough, uh, heavy enough objects that could generate them. They had no idea that a binary black hole system was a thing and that they yeah. saw a binary two black holes now once they saw that and ascertained that then they kept it running for like four more months but uh they only got two other events a black hole and a, and a two black hole neutron stars so they were just kind of lucky then they turned on at the right time <laughs> you know, with their uh, not optimized uh, detector yet and just saw this amazing, you know, thing that, so they, uh, the they're now, of course, are seeing a lot more. They have since improved the system and they're- I, I, I picture Einstein cool. clapping in his in his grave, you know, when, when that happened. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was gonna say, but back to my original point, I think apart from just, you know, the technology of tomorrow, I think literally, and I am not kidding about it at all, I think this saves the world. I think this saves the world. This saves humanity. This gives some kind of like Star Trek does in its weird way, gives somebody, gives us the concept of a future mythology. Gives we us have a, a future. by the way, we have a professor here we who teaches we have a professor here who yes. teaches Star Trek on our show so oh, yeah and that's fan yeah and it's fabulous but i'm saying yeah it's that really did give i mean people really think in terms of like you know the federation of planets and klingons and i i do you know yeah. there's some, i i was hanging i think out it's night happening night out there home of james tiberius kirk and you know it at riverside iowa and i mean it was like you know but really, in, in my uh, my my older the my older colleagues would tell me that they would go to Russia at the height of the Cold War, and they were doing experiments in Novosibirsk, and they really felt that these experiments, these part of they were first nuclear experiments, you know, nuclear physics, not the bombs, but then particle physics, and they really felt that they were preserving like global civil society by having these you know these yeah. signs you know just pure science nothing to do with uh you know the with with military or anything practical and where where i kind of grew up intellectually fermilab just a few miles north of me used to be the you know the biggest atom smasher in the world at the time and i ran into russians the first time i met russians <laughs> Where on that ex was when the uh, my my undergraduate a year as a summer as an undergraduate, and it was just like there's hope because people have real connections with these scientific endeavors, and it is perspective. It is like oh my god, these wars are so goddamn screwed up and ridiculous and unnecessary, yeah. and right. at least Fermilab is keeping open the channels for scientific in you know interactions and i i think the space station is still this kind of thing yeah. is basically what's going to pull us out of the crap we're in right now here's what i oh go ahead 
No, go, go ahead, David. What, what I'd like hey, to your do, program, man. No, 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 no. It's your program. <laughs> what I'd like to do is F, I'm going to beg you to come back. I, I mean, this has just been tremendous. And, it, and it's been great watching Professor Marianne talking to on this show. She talks politics and here it's just a whole other side. Yeah, and I depress what, everybody. <laughs> but I, I want to to me, what would be a great way to end this is introduce you to Lane and Professor Bick if they're here and they want to ask a question. Lane is does comedy on our show. He's also uh, a flyer. You flew. Lane, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. La Lane. Well, the, thing, the things I flew. <laughs> but I, would, you, would you ask, uh, do you have a question that about flying that you... <laughs> <laughs> Did, was your um, landing craft a tail dragger? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I missed that. Was 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 he's what? Call, he's from England, so he. So I was, say, was your landing craft a tail dragger? That's the only thing I ever flew. I flew chipmunk, so it's like it's not quite the same as flying to space. He, he flew, uh, chip, but Rusty flew with the Air Force for you. Did not. Yeah, well, um, I, all, all kinds of different airplanes, but yeah. Yeah. Chip, what uh, did you fly? By the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you fly in the Air Force, by the way? Yeah, oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. No, I was uh, I was an Air Force fighter pilot, a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, and uh, but I flew all kinds of different airplanes, and yeah, that was yeah. Uh, part of my post uh, MIT experience uh, out of ROTC. Yeah. What What did you have most hours on? Missed that. Well, what did you have most your hours on? Oh. Um, I, I suppose uh, I never thought about most, but I, I would think probably uh, the T-38s that we flew um, when I was an astronaut, uh, I probably yeah. got more total hours in, in those than any other one airplane that I, that I flew. Portal, yeah. Right. Great. Well, that's, still, that's still use those, don't they? Yeah. Professor Bick, do you, thank you, Lane. Uh, Professor Bick, you teach a class in Star Trek so do you have any <laughs> he does every friday night here uh, so great do you have any questions i just wanted to thank uh, mr schweiger very much for coming on the program and and sharing with us uh, an amazing perspective that that you have and i think an important one that uh you know we we are just in our infancy and we're on this little ball and we have to recognize that in order to cooperate with one another, in order to um, move to the next step. You know, you, yeah. you made this uh, analogy of coming out of the, the birth canal of Mother Earth. And um, yeah. I, I hope we are able to do that. <laughs> it's looking iffy. Well, that, you know, we, we are, we are. Um... You know we're not innocent uh, players here. We we will shape what happens collectively. And uh, you know I I often think about an hourglass as a as a model. Any time you're talking about birth, you're very close to death. You know at at, at birth, and uh, you know you you come down to this point uh, this narrow point in an hourglass and the question is do you get through or not and i think death and you know the the moment of of birth is a bloody violent process and we are going through that kind of process here wow. on straining the resources of earth etc and having the equivalent of planetary contractions and the question is do we make it through to the point where we start using the resources in space to enable us to go further rather than digging up the earth and creating you know real problems for mother earth i mean there are this this cosmic birth metaphor to me is a very very real process and we are not just uh you know innocent people we are, we are part of the process and so how we make it through, whether we make it through this narrow neck is up to us collectively, yeah. and not, not individually, but collectively. And, 
that to me is a big challenge and it's the reason why we need to be respectful of limits and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you know go yeah. on forever thank you rusty schweiger thank you so much uh how do people if if people wanted to get in touch with you how would they do that is there a oh. website <laughs> <laughs> I want to play golf. I'm a golfer, you know. I I, I gave it the office, you know. I'm happy. Right. I'm happy to get together with you, David. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. I really enjoy it, it, this kind of conversation. But I, 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 don't oh, I thought maybe you had like a Twitter. What I meant to, I, I like a Twitter. Everybody here has a Twitter account. I or don't. a website or a book. <laughs> you're, pl- you're, you're playing golf, okay? Yeah, uh, you, uh, Alan. Uh, uh, been there done that <laughs> yes i'm gonna i'm gonna be uh bug I'm, gonna me. Give, I'm gonna bug you i'm gonna give <laughs> professor marianne the last word with you oh. okay the, the only thing i could think of though when you thought of it when you were the first guy who was you know in space actually outside of i haven't i could not conceive of what zero gravity really is like you know how you got two hundred thousand dollars, Marianne. You can do it now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah the have... vomit comet. Yeah, I don't. But well, we can fly with Bezos, you know, or whatever, or Virgin Galactic. Right. Yes. But so that hey, look, the, that we, we've, have collect, been... we've done it collectively, Marianne. I, it wasn't just me. I did it for you. Yeah. And we all did it for each other. Okay. Great. I'm gonna thank you so much, Rusty Schweiker. Yes. Thank you. This was a highlight of my life. Really, thank you. I'm a, a, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Okay, well, it's a a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you.